Hey guys, welcome back. So what we want to do is dive now deeper into the case example, and that is going to be Abraham. So I want to look at Abraham and look at this area of what I'm going to call the, uh, the six phases of faith. And, and the reason we want to break these out is because when you understand each of these phases, when you understand what it looks like to believe God and move from just believing God for something that he has shared with you to be true, uh, all the way to the point of actually receiving it, uh, there's a lot of meat between believe and receive. Would you agree? Yeah. And so in the faith life and, and this dimension, I think will answer many of the questions. And, and some of you, uh, there'll be questions like, man, why is my Christian life so hard? Or, you know, why is it that I keep falling into a cycle uh, that it just seems like life just keeps happening to me? Why is it uh, that I don't see answers to prayers. And why is, you know, these questions hit us right where we are. So I really believe that when you understand this, it will help you in your daily Christian life. And specifically, it will help to undergird your ability to move from just faithfulness to fruitfulness. Let me just let you in on this. God did not call us just to be faithful. He also called us to be fruitful. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we see this in the story when Jesus is going into Jerusalem and he's walking in and he notices a fig tree and the Bible says he was hungry. He wanted something to eat. He looked down on something he made. <laughs> he created a fig tree and uh, he wanted something. He reached out and the fig tree didn't have fruit. And Jesus <laughs> curses the fig tree. Now, I don't know what words he used, but I just know <laughs> when God curses you, it's not good, mm -hmm. right? That's, it's bad. And uh, Jesus cursed the victory, and he says, you know, you are created and made with a purpose. And when you are not fulfilling the purpose for which you were made, why are you even here? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a hard lesson, yeah. but that's the lesson because the disciples are like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> When they saw Jesus curse the tree, it's like it's it died. That was a tree. Like, that yeah. tree just died. It's a tree. It didn't have a thing. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing I want to get across to you. Uh, you are not put on this planet as a Christian, as a believer, and a follower of Christ, just to breathe air and take up space. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of Christians who who consider their journey uh, of being a Christian is trying to stay out of as much trouble as possible mm. and hang on to heaven. Mm. And man, I'm, and, and if you tell them, you know, you'll look at them and they're like, they're not serving, they're not honoring God, they're not witnessing, they're not giving, they're just, and here's what they would say to you. I'm just trying to be faithful. I'm just trying to be faithful. Well, can I just tell you, uh, God didn't just call you to be faithful, he called you to also to be fruitful. He said, I'm the vine and you're the branches and a branch that does not bear fruit is pruned off and thrown into the fire. So this this issue I'm talking about in faith goes beyond some ethereal case study where you kind of go, well, wasn't it nice for Abraham? I'm talking about you, your personal walk with God, and you will never, ever, ever, ever accomplish anything for the kingdom of God apart from faith. So this stuff matters that we're talking about. So let's look at the the six phases of faith, how they applied in Abraham's life, and then we'll give some other study case studies along the way. Phase one, here's first phase. First phase is God gives you a dream. He plants the seed of vision inside of your heart. Now, we see this in Genesis uh, chapter 12. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord came to Abraham, and he said to him, I'm sorry, to Abram, and he says to him, Abram, I want you to Go from your country, your people, and your household to the land that I will show you. In other words, future, trend, future tense. Yeah, he didn't see it. He didn't even say where you're heading. Mm -hmm. He just says, he says, start walking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, now, this is kind of cool for him, but I can't imagine, you know, when he had to come home and tell mama, you know, pack up the tent. <laughs> where are we even? going? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> when are we leaving? Right yeah. now. Yeah. You know, which direction? Not sure. Uh, he, he, I can't imagine this kind of response yet. This is actually what God always does. God always asks us to do something which doesn't make sense. That's a dream. 
And sometimes he plants that dream deep inside of your heart and, and you, you, you struggle to figure out, you know, is that, is that me? Is that God? What, where, what is that happening? But here's what I can tell you. Uh, God calls us to greatness, mm -hmm. not just to ordinary believing life. He wants us to really accomplish things that could never have been accomplished without God planting a seed. Uh, I said it this way, nothing of importance happens on earth until someone hears from heaven. Nothing of importance will ever happen on earth until someone hears from heaven. You know, when you look at that, I mean, that that's why when the person who really isn't kind of doing anything he says, oh, pastor, I'm just trying to be faithful. They're not even using the word the right way. Yeah. Like what they're calling faithful isn't faith at all. They're not full of faith by just kind of getting by. Yeah. Being full of faith would be, oh my gosh, I don't understand how God used me to accomplish this amazing thing. Um, yeah. And so often- They're full of something. Yeah. So often we just go, well, you know, I, I'm faithful. And by that, I mean, I, I show up once a yeah. week or <laughs> yeah. I do the bare minimum yeah. to get by. And that's that's counter to yeah. even I'm, what we're I'm talking. not backsliding. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I'm not doing anything, but, you know, <laughs> at least I'm not backsliding, you yeah. know. I'm just kind of hanging on and hanging out. Yeah. So it starts with this idea of God plants inside of our heart a dream, a vision. You know, Proverbs 29 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. God always plants a vision, and that vision is always carried out by someone who is just crazy enough to believe who's crazy enough to believe God and take him at his word. So how do I know when the dream is from God? Here, I've given two of these. Uh, it, it, when, when, the, when the dream in your heart advances God's plan, not your plan. Mm -hmm. When it brings God glory, not you glory. When that, when that dream is something that really looks like it's moving God's kingdom ahead, not my little kingdom ahead, you can be pretty sure that that was God's dream. Yeah. And the second one is this, when, when I have to rely on God's power to accomplish it and not my power, one of the ways that you know that God has given you a vision that's beyond yourself is it scares you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it scares you. You know, you're like, oh, I don't know about it. So for me, you know, I have a lot of these, now I haven't had hundreds of these, but I've had a lot of these uh, over the years of my life. Uh, as a believer, 40, 40 years as a believer, where God has planted this dream in my heart, uh, I had one of these leave and move when God uh, challenged me to leave Tulsa and to move to Fort Worth to go to school to pursue uh, education for the calling of the ministry. And I literally did this. I, I came home, my pastor challenged me, and he said, I believe God wants you to, uh, to quit your job and move to Fort Worth. Now, honestly, there, there was no pathway for that. I didn't have savings. I didn't have a lot of money. I, I, and when he said it, I knew it was true. So on the way home, I said, okay, God, if this is from you, then, then Lisa will respond mm, positively. Such a smart husband. Now, mm -hmm. now, I was smart because I thought I was setting God up. Because <laughs> <laughs> you thought, there's no way Lisa's going to get it. I hate to say it, but that was kind of happening. You know, you're kind of like, yeah. oh, that'll never go over, you know. Yeah. So I got home and I said, uh, I said, uh, hey, we're uh, brother. I just had breakfast with Brother Bill. He said, we should just, I should just quit my job, put the house up on the, uh, for the sale and move to Fort Worth with no job or anything. What do you think? And uh, Lisa, I'll never forget. She looked at me and she said, uh, well, I, I wonder when we were going to do that. I oh, mean, God. I, I, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what the <laughs> so on. I tried to talk her out of it a little bit. I was like, I mean, you know, is she? Brother Bill call you. Yeah. <laughs> I think, oh, I've never verified that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I really did. I, I kind of put that as, you know, we, Christians call it a fleece. You know, we, we put the fleece out there and that's from an Old Testament story. I said, really you, God? And I'm kind of like that guy because he had to yeah. test him. And then he untested and he tested in a new way. And, you know, finally he was like, okay, I guess God has to be in it. But, but when you, you know, when you see something and God asks you to do something, you know, this cannot be, I don't know how this could happen. I don't know how it could yeah. be accomplished, but I'm just going to believe God and he'll fill in the details. Yeah. And I can't help but want to do a little family perspective thing here. Okay. So, um, this whole going to my spouse for confirmation about something God's saying, that's not just for pastors. Like that's for everybody. And even when I was a kid, when I was, was talking with, with the old guy who was my pastor growing up, he said, look, when you grow up and you get married, 
God's going to tell you something. You always want to check with your wife because he's going to tell her something too. And he said a lot of times she's going to have a lot clearer picture than what you yeah. have. Yeah. So I don't know I don't know what that's all about, but for some reason the, the wife yeah. just got it going on in the whole faith yeah. department oftentimes. And so uh, husbands, man, value your wife's opinion on these things as you're going through this journey of faith. She's pro she might be two steps ahead of you, and if you're trying to make this decision and you haven't checked in with her, wow, you, you, what are you missing out on? Yep. And yep. That's not something that's just for pastors. Faith is a big deal. Yep. yep. I, I'm sure that for many years, Pilate's wife was <laughs> reminding him, I told you. I told you. I told you not to do that. I told you not to mess with him. Yeah. <laughs> now, then you've got Job's wife, and I yeah, don't even know where to yeah, go with yeah, that. No, okay, no, we won't right, touch that yeah, one. We won't even touch that <laughs> one. Look at this verse with me. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says this. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So in other words, uh, God is bigger than what we could even dream or imagine. And so when, you, when God plants the dream, that seed of like a, a dream, and for Abraham that was, uh, I'm taking you on a journey, let's go. Do you trust me or not? It always leads you to phase two. Phase two is a decision. And most, most dreams die on the floor of decision. Mm -hmm. God plants a dream in your heart and you go, I, I don't, I can't. I won't. Yeah. I never could. I, I don't think happen. I can't. Yeah, yeah, I just don't see it. I, you know, I need more. I, you know, God, God, you got to lay it out for me. You know, if you'll show me the map, yeah. Yeah, right. where we're heading and tell me the roads, you know, then I, I, I'll give it consideration. But the, honestly, I think that's where most Christians... Uh, you know, that's where they fall short on the ability to do something great for God. God's never going to call you, you know, to do something great for him, which, which is rational. Mm. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be something you go, Whoa, wait, what? That makes sense. Uh, and that's where things die. And so look what he does. He makes a decision. Verse 4 of Genesis 12. So Abraham went. You know, you could just stop right <laughs> yeah, there. Right. So he went. Now, this is what makes Abram the, the great father of faith. Because uh, I love the beauty of his spirit here. Uh, God says, let's go. And he says, all right. Yeah. And real faith it involves this dimension of obedience. Obeying God is doing what God says, uh, the way God says, when God says, with the right heart attitude. That's obedience. And anything short of that is disobedience. Mm -hmm. And so for the believer, when God says to do, he's, he's God, mm -hmm. the creator of the universe. When God says jump, you, you can say how high, but you better be in the air. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you better already be <laughs> in the air <laughs> when, when you say, okay, but how high? Look at this, and it says, he just went as the Lord had told him. In other words, it was an obedience to what God had revealed. Not just what he wanted, but what God had said for him to do. And, and this little side note's going to come into play. Now, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So he was no spring puppy. If you think he's just having, you know, we expect like an 18-year-old to have mm -hmm. this vision, you know, and I'm going to jump out and, you know, God told me to do it and I'm going to go. And we kind of expect that because we look at those people and we say, well, you know, they just don't have enough life, you know, and they haven't had enough experience to figure this out. But this guy's been walking with God a long time. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I'm only, I'm, you know, I'm 55, but I, the older you get, it seems the harder it is to, to respond and react because yeah. I've got so much vested. Well, yeah, and I think also you get comfortable and, you're, yeah. and you, you take less risk, which I think show us, that's what it shows us with Abram is that, hey, even though you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you still need to take some risk. You still need to yeah. be willing to, to listen to him, walk by faith in him and and that and it might be later in life even you know i think i think that's an encouragement isn't it as well because it's like you're god's not done with you that's I right mean, you might be you know in your 50s in your 60s in your 70s and god wants to do something in you and he'll still use you i think that's what's encouraging for the believer in jesus christ there's no such Every thing time. as retirement mm -hmm. there's only reassignment mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> did you hear what i said there is no such thing as retirement there's only reassignment there's more for you to do until you draw your last breath. So he's yeah. got to make a decision. And he says, God, I'm all in. Now listen, here's the thing. Uh, a, a dream from God will always cost you something. It will always cost you. And I think about uh, the process that you have to go through 
where he has to leave behind. God says, leave your country, your family, everything that you know, leave that behind and go to this destination. And the truth is, you can never go where God wants you and stay where God has put you. you you've got to let go of where you are right now and say, I'm leaving the comfortable, the known, the dimension of, of, of comfort, and I'm going to go into the, com the, the dimension of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And, but you can't get where God wants you until you leave where God has you. You've got to leave there. Uh, think of the trapeze artist. You know, I don't know if <laughs> they do this anymore. You have to go to Cirque du Soleil when there's not COVID or yeah, something. something but yeah. Yeah. but uh, w in order for them uh, to do what they do, they swing out on one you know, side of the trapeze, and the other one is coming at them at the same time. And what's interesting is that they can't actually quite get to this one. Yeah. unless they let go of this one. There's, that, there's those few moments when they have to yeah. uh, have nothing holding them, and they let go and fly through the air just a few feet to grab to this one. That's faith. And mm -hmm. that's the dimension of saying, okay, this, I'm all in, God. Yeah. And they're all in. There's, yeah. Now, the, the, the alternative is to say, well, I'm going to see if it'll ever get closer. And then, you and then what happens? You just do this until it reaches a complete dead stop. I know some Christians like that. Yeah. They just kept saying, God, bring it, bring it a little closer. Make it a little clearer. Make it easier for me to obey you. You know, the truth is, a lot of people do this with the tithe. The fact is, you, you may never, ever be able to work out the ration and the reason and the budget and the numbers. Mm -hmm. And God says, okay, but do you believe. Mm -hmm. Do you trust me? And this is the dimension where God, listen, I'm just going to say it like it is. God will not bless your finances as long as you keep holding out on him in disobedience. So, so I, I don't know why this is. I don't know that this is a guarantee, but stuff just works better and lasts longer in household of faith. Yeah. People who believe God, trust God, and make tithing a priority some reason their stuff works longer. <laughs> you know, the car doesn't seem to break down quite as much. And, you know, all the things kind of come together because God takes yeah. care of people who trust him. Yeah. Getting over this moment of being able to let go of this one and fly through the air and grab that one. You know, the first two kind of faith things that you do in your whole life, that's like, oh, this is so hard. Am I really going to be able to do this? But then you do it one time and you're like, hey, that worked out. And then you do it a second and you're like, hey, that worked out. And suddenly you realize, um, yeah, I, it cost me something. Yeah, it's hard. But... God loves me, and God is inviting me to be a part of something that is going to bring him glory that's bigger than anything I could ever do on my own, and it, the reward on the back end of saying, oh my gosh, I just did something that impacted eternity yeah. by letting go of this little thing, and, and what I feel like is you almost end up getting addicted to this idea of I can, I can move on, I can do something for God, okay, what else can I let go of, what else can I let go of, and you get momentum behind that thing, but the first two times... It's like, but does God really love yeah. me? And is God yeah. really going to yeah. use me? I think and, of the guy who was on a cliff and he slid, he slid off and he's, he's scared to death. And he's ah, God help me. And he grabs a limb. And he's holding on to the limb and he's go, I'm too far down. I can't reach the cliff. What do I do? And he prays and he says, God, help me. What do I do? And he hears the voice of God say, let go. <laughs> and he thinks about it for a minute and he says, is anyone else That's out there? Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to let go. Oh my goodness. Okay, so you move from a, a dream to a decision. Am I going to trust God or not? You make the decision, and, and all of a sudden, everything happens, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> because the next phase of faith is delay. There's always a period of waiting. Uh, Genesis 15, it says, The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, and says, don't be afraid. Now recognize, we've moved several chapters now, so years have gone by. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield. I am your very great reward. Now, now, I love the fact that throughout these chapters, God is revealing himself, his character, and Abram's life is actually changing. He's becoming uh, a, a more godly man and in a deeper connected relationship. Abram says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? Mm -hmm. Now, I love this because he's, he's saying, okay, God, 
remember that thing, yeah. thing that we were going to do? But God took him outside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars, and if indeed you can count them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And so Abram believed the Lord, and, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, this, this verse right here in Genesis 15, 6 is that anchor verse that Paul just mentioned in Romans 4, that, that God credited his faith as being made right with him as righteousness and becomes the model of how everyone is saved from that day forward. We're saved by believing. Now, the circumstances is what we don't always see. The, the context of his belief and being counted righteous was doubt. Yeah. It, it was a sense of, um, God, you put a dream in my heart and I, I haven't seen it. And, and I'm, I'm trying desperately to hold on to what you said, but I don't see it. Now, I don't know if it's for you. Maybe that's a wayward child. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe it's an illness. Uh, maybe it's a marriage that just seems completely uh, loveless and hopeless. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I know all of us get there. Mm -hmm. You get to that stage where you're just like, God, I, I believe you, but help me in my unbelief. Remember mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. in the Gospels, the guy yeah. that came and he yeah, said, yeah. I, I do believe, yeah. but, but help me in my unbelief. And, and so that's a dimension of faith we don't often you know, a lot of the, lot of the faith movements in the church mm -hmm. uh, base their movement on my ability to stay strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But true Christianity doesn't work that way. No. You know, because God knows us. He knows who we are. He knows right. we're but dust. He knows that the fact is that we're, we're, we're frail, sinful, fallen human beings. And if, if, if in order for me to receive what God has for me, depends on my power and strength, we're all doomed. Yeah. Right, we're in trouble. We're all doomed. I, do, I just think this is a, just a beautiful, beautiful moment because, I mean, this could have been interpreted as, well, now Ab Abraham is questioning God, right? But that's not what he's doing here. He's expressing right. what's genuinely going on in his heart, and pouring he's pouring out it out. Heart, yeah. And God could have looked down and said, I told you what I told you. Get up and get going. Forget this mess. And, and you need to straighten up, Abraham, believe and have faith. That's not what he does. It's like he reaches down and takes the hand of a little child and just re-shows him again the thing that he said from the beginning and re-imbues yeah. in him this, this sense of, no, it's good. We're good. I got you. We're going to do the thing we said we're going to do. And he, and he builds him up. And so it's so awesome to see how God responds lovingly when we need it the most. He's not like this big angry God that's like, how dare you question what I'm saying? Um, but it also is very important that we point out that in this moment, Abraham was not questioning God. Right. He was pouring out his heart before him, and, and, and it's safe. It's okay for us to do that with God. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I just love it. It's so beautiful that we have a God who, who works with us where we are, how we're feeling, and what we're going through. And Abraham, Abraham's like, you know, I thought we were on the child, you know, train. Yeah. yeah. But, but I don't know where you're going. So, you know, the question is, have you ever been in a hurry when God isn't? <laughs> yeah. You know, well, we've all been there where you just feel like, God, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, you know, and God's not. So what's the waiting period all about? And here's the key. The, the waiting period between uh, the, that delay, between the dream and actually receiving it is because while we're working on the plan, God mm -hmm. is actually working on our person. Mm -hmm. We're working on, we want to see, oh, the plan needs to go to the next step, and, and God is actually working inside of the, our heart to say, no, 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 you don't understand. You're not ready mm -hmm. for the next phase. The delay isn't God withholding and saying, well, you know, I'm holding back to just see if it really ticks you off. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> it's not withholding. It's actually preparation. There's never a phase in your life where God is not at work. And that's what delay feels like. It feels like God actually kind of checked out and he's, he's took his eye off the ball. No, he's actually carving and crafting inside of you the character needed that you're going to have to rely on for the next phase because mm -hmm. you're not ready. 
you're not ready for that next phase to move to that next level. And so we, uh, we respond to delays in different ways. You know, we, we do it when doubt, we do it uh, in you know, detours, we try to take matters into our own hands. And, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened with Aram. He said, well, God, you know, you're taking a while and- Must, must have forgot what you said, so uh, I'll go ahead and do it myself. <laughs> I'll take care of that for you. Take care of that for we you. can take care of this, you know. His wife, uh, this, as the Bible tells us, his wife comes in and says, well, I got this handmaiden. And uh, now, now, in case you read into this, you think, well, this is kind of like, what in the heck is happening here? He's, he's having sex with the handmaiden, you know, and all this, the maid, right? You know, what is this? And uh, this is actually common to use a proxy child for couples that were childless. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's happening. His Sarah gives the permission for, says, use my handmaiden to, to bring forth a child. We'll adopt that child into the household and then that will be the seed. And she, she says that. And instead of Abram going to God, mm -hmm. he used just his ration. And he just said, well, okay. And Sounds so, good. you know, that's what they did. And, and there was always a problem when we tried to do God's purposes in, uh, with our power. Mm -hmm. Anytime we say, I'm going to take matters into my own hands, you're dead in the water. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. And then uh, sometimes uh, we just leads to despair. And that's what, that's what we find with, with him. So I want to end with this verse in this session, and, and uh, then we'll move into the next phases, and it's in Habakkuk 2.3. And the Bible says this, Because the things that I plan, says the Lord, will not happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time will approach is when the vision will be fulfilled. Now, if it seems slow, do not despair. For these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. You see, they'll not be overdue even a single day. And so God says, listen, when I've given you a word and I've given you my promise, trust it. Yeah. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing that can prevent uh, what God wants to do in your life, nothing can go against the will of God. And so God says, listen, just trust me that during the season of delay, God is still making a way. And that way actually is through you. It's through your own heart. So with that, let's break here with the first three phases. And then in the next session, we'll finish it out. We'll see you then.